Welcome to Political Alchemy, coming to you from the Captain's Lounge Studios, located right here in Longmont, Colorado. Once again, I have my guest, Ben Garajaboy, who is running for District 48 in Well County. Last time we talked about fracking, this time we're in the contentious issues of health care. But first, Benga, how are things going with the campaign? Thanks for having me back, and uh, things are going pretty well. I am interacting more with the voters, and I'm beginning to see that regardless of political affiliation, the voters of Weld County have similar concerns. Beyond oil and gas, healthcare is key in a lot of, a lot of their hearts, and that's why I'm taking the time out to come talk about healthcare here today. Perfect, perfect. Also, I think another point worth mentioning is you're taking no special interest money at all for your campaign, are you? Yes, we have right. pledged that we are not taking money from special interest. We're going to get all our money from the voters. We are trying to put democracy in a test. And let us put, let us tell the nation now what it is that democracy is, that is about the people, Absolutely. not about the interest. Absolutely. Anyway. I know healthcare is a, is a heck of a contentious issue in this country, um, and I'm a Brit, so I grew up under the National Health Service, and we'll talk a little bit about that later. However, why don't you take us through your plans, which are very, very deep, inspired, of what you would like to see happen within the Weld County area? So my campaign has uh, adopted the word sustainable healthcare, with the principle of restoring the body back to its stable state when it's sick. And in doing that, we will not uh, bankrupt the system, and we also will be very conscious of the environment. So this sustainable health care, it's a very complex definition that has the people in the middle of it. The core of this health care will be the people. And when we talk about the people, we're talking about the women, the elderly, and the young ones, and people who have some hereditary disease, because this is the core of our health care. Beyond that, as an elected official, we want to also now look into, you know, looking at the lifestyle, the choices that people make. For example, we have done a good job by, you know, putting water fountains in school. Mm -hmm. That will enable the kids to make a choice of drinking water rather than soda. Those are kind of preventive stuff, uh, uh, actions that we're taking. A lot of people don't think about it in terms of health care. But this health care that is called sustainable health care will look into this kind of you know, decisions that can be taken to help the masses make those choices. Beyond that, we look at you know, how does health care have, what does it have to do with the economy? And uh, the act what about the activities that people are engaged in, like riding bicycle, walking out? And what about our environment? Are we building a homes close to the mall or very far, are people encouraged to really take a walk rather than drive to everywhere, then like we have done with oil and gas, what are the impact of these pollutions that are going into the environment to our healthcare? This is an overall uh, approach mm -hmm. that this campaign is adopting to healthcare. Right, so, so you're looking at healthcare across living styles all the way through to being taken seriously ill and having to go to hospital. Exactly. You're, you're bundling the whole thing as sort of like a package. Now, you've got a very interesting graph here. Why, why don't you tell us a little bit about how this works? So like in this graph, right, this is actually something that has been adopted by some experts. Like if you look at this graph right now, you see in the core of it, like we have said, are the people. When the people are put in consideration, then we want to say, okay, what kind of choices are they making that is making them sick? Because if we can be prevent, if people can take preventive measures, mm -hmm. then they might be sick less, and we might spend less money in healthcare. And if we have done that, we know that when people are in the community, like you watch out for your neighbor, you reach out to you know your friends, it could help them live longer. Mm -hmm. Then beyond that, if they are rich or poor, that can determine whether or not they're going to be sick or healthy. Are they active or inactive? Are they in an environment that is safe, that has no other pollution? What about the ecosystem? Are they 
do we still have those natural things that should be? Because if the, say, the organisms are dying, somewhat whatever is killing them is going to get to the people. And uh, what about how do we, with the pollution that is going on into our environment, how does it affect the people? If we are able as a government to look into all of these different stages, then we can now say, okay, if people are now sick, how do we now ensure that they have the care they want without mm -hmm. also going bankrupt? And of course, that's the key, yeah. not going bankrupt, just because you're taken ill through no fault of your own even. Yeah. So, so, talk about costings a little bit. Um, I mean, we've got all of these very, very interesting things. Talk about how, say, Medicaid would work within, say, Well County or even Colorado. I've been looking at Weld County and the state of Colorado. I've seen that the price of healthcare here is very expensive. For example, the state of Colorado alone is, sell, is spending $7.2 billion on healthcare. And Weld County is spending $354 million. And I look at what's driving this cost. Both in the state of Colorado and in Weld County is a pharmacy claim. And we know that... So, so pharmaceuticals are the biggest cost expenditure? In Weld County and in the state of Colorado. Wow. Followed by the outpatient hospital. And in contrast, during the last legislative session, uh, uh, the, so several bills were brought up that was calling for transparency in pharmaceutical drugs, the pricing, and the bill failed. It did fail, and I'm here sitting down thinking, if this is what's taking most of our money, why is our elected official, what exactly is it that is not making them pass a transparency bill on pharmaceutical company? And if, when, e when elected, these are the kind of things I want to go into. I'm going to sit down and walk through and find out why is our pharmaceutical companies not transparent in their pricing? Are there things we can do to drive these costs down? This is what this campaign is about. Have there been any other significant bits of legislation related to health care that have, that have not been postponed or failed? or Are there any others? No, some have actually made it but I am curious with those that didn't make it. For example, the HB 181260 that is asking for pres prescription drug transparency, the bill failed. The bill was introduced in April and it failed in the House. It and this is just being transparent. Exactly. It's not trying to bring the, the prices down, it's just be honest on how you're charging for your drugs. Exactly, and those bills fail. It failed, and I don't know why, but when elected, these are the kind of questions I want to ask. Oh, I think I do know why. I think I know where the pharmaceutical money is going. Maybe that's why we are saying we want our money to come from the voters, rather yes. than from the special interests. And interestingly, I also saw some other things that are happening in the state of Colorado mm -hmm. that is driving up the price of health care. For example, there's this pro proliferation of freestanding emergency room around the state. This case was captured, it started recently. Now they have over 50 of these freestanding emergency room. Mm -hmm. And there was a case of a gentleman in Avada, his name is Ken, and the kid had an injury in the kitchen, just a regular injury. He was looking for where he could take the chai to he went on his Google map, and the Google map said, oh, there's an emergency care close to you. A caring parent won't think about what's next. You want your child to be well. He took the kids to the emergency care unit. He was take, she was taken care of. He got home, and he got a bill of $6,400. And he was like, what is going on? Only to find out that 5600 of this fee is for the emergency visit. And some of this uh, increase in price was because sometimes you have this freestanding uh, free emergency room with a doctor that is not in network. Uh -huh. And you don't know. You don't know the price. You just go there you know, for your own well-being. And the hospital is not transparent. In the, same bill, in the same bid, the house brought a bill about the same time asking for the hospitals to be very transparent in their, what they charge. And the bill failed. 
I mean, as, as soon as the gentleman checked into this emergency care unit, they should have warned him up front that I'm terribly sorry, the doctor that is on duty at the moment is not in your network. And, of course, if you go to the hospital, the last thing you want to think about is the price. But that was what caught him. Well, and I, see, unfortunately, I don't agree with you on that particular point because there are a lot of people that live here in Colorado where they have to be worried about the price. Well, you shouldn't. I mean, if, I the, know healthcare you shouldn't. Was, if the healthcare was good enough... I agree. That I agree with. And, and these are the kind of problems that I'm running. These are the kind of reasons why I'm running. Mm -hmm. So that when I get elected... I want to be passing legislation that would be focused on the people, like I said, such that when you get sick, the last thing on your mind that you should be worrying about should be the cost. You should know what it's going to cost you, and it should be affordable. Absolutely. Actually, um, a little earlier today, we had a very interesting uh, interview, and um, I think it would be worth hearing the story. What was her name, Kim? Kim. I think it would be well worth hearing the story that Kim had to say about what happened to her using the health care system here in Colorado. In 2004, my husband and I moved to Greeley, and he started a new job. Um, and we were in a waiting period for insurance. We still had um, insurance through his old employer, which was also my employer. I was working part-time for them. And they did not offer maternity insurance um, through that company, so we didn't have maternity insurance. But he was transitioning to this new job, and we would have maternity insurance through that new job, but we were in a waiting period. And we were told that that period would be about a month. And during that month, we found out that I was um, pregnant. Pregnancy was also considered a pre-existing condition. So if we started to, you know, tell the insurance companies that I was pregnant that at that time, they would not cover me. Um, so we had to wait on the initial ultrasound was, is basically the takeaway there. 20 weeks, my doctor said, you know, let's just, let's just do a quick ultrasound um, in his office on this old ultrasound machine and discover that I was indeed pregnant with twins, um, identical twins, which are right away that classified me as a high-risk pregnancy. Because we had waited to have the ultrasound until halfway through my pregnancy, um, they couldn't tell certain things because the babies were big enough that they couldn't see certain things. Namely, they couldn't tell if um, they shared a placenta, which made them a much higher risk. I was at that time finally covered by our new insurance, had maternity insurance, was able to see a specialist down in Denver. They were keeping an eye on things, um, but they just, they didn't know certain things about the pregnancy. Just shy of 32 weeks, I went into labor, and the policy at the time at, at North Colorado Medical Center, if the pregnancy is less than 32 weeks, they cannot keep them there in the NICU. The NICU was not um, set up to, to take babies younger than that. So they flew me in a helicopter to Press St. Luke's in Denver to have the babies. Now, that was not like an optional thing at all. They just said, this is what we're doing, and that's what we did. Uh, we found out later that was not covered by your insurance. And we found that out later when we started getting the bills for, the, <laughs> for their NICU stay and for the, um, for the helicopter ride. Um, anyway, so the babies were born at Press St. Luke's in Denver. They were sharing a placenta, and they experienced something called twin-to-twin -twin transfusion, which means that um, one of my boys transfused blood to his brother while they were, while they were um, being born. And so he was born very anemic. We didn't find out about the um, oxygen deprivation and the brain bleed until um, my son Jack was about six months old. Uh, Press St. Luke's has a really great program where they have um, preemie babies come in for testing, and they at that time realized that his testing was showing that he wasn't reaching milestones. Right around the time when we um, went in to Press St. Luke's, it was suggested to me that we apply for Medicaid for my son so that it would cover things like the, the trip to the neurologist and the MRI. And so with the diagnosis of cerebral palsy, he was able to get Medicaid, and that helped a lot because it started paying for all of those bills and um, things like, you know, he, he then started having therapy once a week, speech therapy when he was talking, um, physical therapy and occupational therapy. I think things may have gone differently for us, very differently, and certainly not have had, you know, a decade worth of <laughs> stress and, you know, worry. 
I think that one thing the ACA did was make it harder for insurance companies to offer insurance policies that did not include maternity. If uh, pregnancy weren't considered a, a pre-existing condition, um, we could have had an earlier ultrasound, maybe could have seen that the baby shared a uh, placenta, and maybe could have taken some other kinds of precautions. The helicopter ride from uh, NCMC to Press St. Luke's was not covered because it was out of network. Well, just prior to that, my husband and I were unable to um, afford good insurance for ourselves. We, we had employer-based insurance through his company, but then our circumstances changed, and he, we had to shop for um, an, an insurance policy on the individual market, and we had to pay an incredibly high um, amount for really awful insurance for ourselves. Um, which was a huge source of stress, and we couldn't afford to go to the doctor for a while because there was a, a hundred dollar pay for doctor visits, and there was a huge deductible if either of us got um, sick or were hurt. Um, under the expansion of the AC Medicaid under the ACA, we um, were able to qualify for Medicaid for ourselves as well, and as a result, we have been able to pay off some debt. We're coming to the age where we need to get better care for ourselves anyway. We need to get some. Um, you know, preventative care that will make a difference for us in the long run. And if that is taken away, that, that, will, that will be hugely problematic for us as well. Now, we saw from that interview that through no fault of the family, they got trapped in the cost problem. Now, this was before the ACA, of course, um, but with what's happening in Washington at the moment, who knows whether the ACA will actually be able to continue because they keep just whittling little bits out of it. And unfortunately, the bits they're whittling are the key components of what made the ACA so good. One of the things I couldn't believe uh, what Kim told us was, how can pregnancy be a pre-existing pre condition? The, the, this issue of uh, health care, uh, it's failed. Of, of course, it's not working at the federal level. Right. But as a state, we can do something to send a signal. Massachusetts has shown by example that healthcare could be something that the state can handle. And I'm running to represent the House District 48 because mm -hmm. I want to be sure that healthcare comes under my radar and we want to genuinely sit down and find help to solving the problem. And let me go into the ACA. We all know that the ACA was passed into law in 2010, but it didn't take full effect until 2015. Mm -hmm. And it was interesting to look at the numbers. So before 2010, that's okay, let's say 2010 in the state of Colorado, the uninsured rate, let's just, let's just look at the factor uninsured, that's people who are able to get who are not able to get insurance. The uninsured rate in the state of Colorado, as at that time, was 15.9%. And in Weld County, it was 18.3%. Wow, that's in high. In 2010. Now, after the Affordable Care Act has been passed, in 2013, the uninsured rate in the state of Colorado dropped to 14.3%. But interestingly, Weld County took a very proactive step by expanding Medicaid. And you can see Kim mentioned that in mm -hmm. her interview. And the uninsured rate in Well County dropped to 10.7%. When the, L the ACA went into full effect in 2015, the state of Colorado uninsured rate dropped to like 6.7%, and Well County dropped to 6.5%. Then we have this election in 2016. Then Affordable Care had became something that was a target. Mm -hmm. As a result, the state of Colorado took the decision of keeping the Medicaid expansion and they still maintain a low uninsured rate of 6.5%. But like in the case of implementing the Affordable Care Act, Well County took the proactive step and Well County is already taking another proactive negative step and the uninsured rate in Well County in 2017 has gone up to 9.6%. The philosophy with the Affordable Care Act and Medicaid is they are trying to make Medicaid a fix, a fix, a, a blood ground. They, they, they call it, uh, they, they try to make it a blood ground, which means the federal government sets the price. Mm -hmm. They tell Medicaid that you cannot pay beyond this amount. 
for certain things. Now, what does that affect, affect women's health? Yes. Like Kima said, you and I don't get pregnant. We probably are not going to pay for maternity expenses for the rest of our life. What about the women? And we are also in the act of telling women what is covered and what is not covered. Mm -hmm. Like I said, healthcare should be bringing you back to your stable state, period. Period. I did a little bit of investigating um, when we knew we were going to be doing this show, and I, I, I found some interesting facts and figures. Today, the National Health Service spends approximately $150 billion per year to keep the National Health Service running. That means that taxpayers in the UK have to contribute $3,900 per year. Immediately you can see there's an issue here because I used to spend more than $3,900 when I was a working staff just for my part of the health insurance. The rest of the health insurance was being sponsored by the company that I work for. The, the UK population is 66.5 uh, million people, very approximately, which works out at about $2,267 per person per year for health insurance. Now, not too shabby. There are approximately 1.33 million people on Medicaid in Colorado. When you look at, as, as we just talked about, the costings here, this means that every Medicaid patient was spending $5,467 per year, which is 2.4 times greater than the UK. Americans often describe the US healthcare system as the best in the world. But according to the reports of the Commonwealth Fund, the US healthcare system ranks last amongst the 11 high-earning countries. It's not number one. The World Health Organization has the UK ranked as number 18 for providing care. Where's the US? Number 37. Right alongside Cuba, we pay nearly twice what other countries pay for health care. And there's something really wrong. Sorry for my little editorial, but it's something that really does get me upset. We think our healthcare in this country is so good because we have not really compared it to the rest of the world. Healthcare is a big problem, but the solution has been fixed. The problem has been addressed in other countries. Now, over as a, and over, over again. again. And I'm willing, as an elected official, to learn. Let us see what they have done right. I mean, there's this popular African proverb that said, the horse that is riding in front, if he falls in a hole, it teaches those us behind a good lesson. Mm -hmm. I can go learn from these other advanced countries that have got it right. Of course, they made some mistakes. Yes. I don't want to learn, I don't want to pick their mistakes. I want to learn from their mistakes and learn what they did right and do it better here in the state of Colorado. So I urge the citizens of Wet County, think about it when you are voting. This health care is not about being Republican or being Democratic or independent. If you get sick, it doesn't care. And when you go to the hospital, I can guarantee you, the hospital is not going to give you a discount because you're a Republican or because you're a Democrat or an independent. They're going to put the bill on you. Mm -hmm. I personally, I will share my own experience. My son got sick at birth. In fact, the first and foremost, when my wife had a baby, she was put on short-term disability mm -hmm. just for having a baby. As if that was not enough, this kid got a little complication, and the bill was in the hundreds of thousands of dollars. If not for the insurance and the fact that we have some money in the savings, he would have been bankrupt. So I'm you, urging... You, you, you'd have been under... For years and years and years. Just look at, Kim just talked about how they went through this pain mm -hmm. because they have to pay for this health care. It doesn't matter what political affiliation that Kim is, it doesn't matter. Right. I can't guarantee you, and I'm looking straight and asking you, citizens of Wet County, have you gone to the hospital? Is your experience different because you're a Democrat, Republican, or Independent? or your experience is the same. So I tell you in this election, please and please, 
forget about this party rumor, the hate politics. I'm not in for that. I'm in to solve a problem here. Forget about all this division. Oh, is this, is that, is that. It doesn't matter. We are all human. And when we vote, let our election, let our voting reflect that. I urge you to vote for Benga Jiboye in this election. And when elected, I want to talk to you. I want to keep this conversation going. Because I want this particular election to be about the people. And we can put this to test. Right. A couple of numbers, folks, that you really ought to know about. I've got here a list of some countries. Supposing you had to go for bypass surgery. Very standard procedure nowadays. It's nothing complicated. It's uh, about a two or three day at the worst. If you li lived in Australia, it would cost you $42,000. If you lived in the Netherlands, it would cost you $15,000. If you lived in New Zealand, it would cost you $40,000. If you lived in Switzerland, it would cost you $36,000. If you lived in Canada, France, Germany, or the UK, it would cost you no dollars. Here in the US, it'll cost you $73,000. Double any other country that is on the list. And I have lots of other things. Please look this up on the internet. The information is out there. You, you know, on the campaign trail, you know the other things I've heard about the wait time? Mm -hmm. And a gentleman told me that, oh, you know the problem with healthcare with in the UK or you in other countries is that if they are old, they are not taken as priority. Then I started investigating in fact, the whole time is longer if you are doing a cosmetic surgery. Yes. Period. End of story. Every other kind of attention, if you get sick, there's no wait time. People need to um, get their fact right. And you are from the UK, you are yeah. experienced. My, 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 sadly, my mum passed in January. Uh, she was 94 years oh, old. Sorry to hear that. If she picked up the phone because she was ill, there would be a doctor around to see her within hours. If she needed to go to hospital, the doctor would phone for the ambulance. The ambulance would be there in minutes. So you agree with me that this whole notion of the wait time being longer is a fallacy? It's not a fallacy, but when it is critical care, it yeah. is a fallacy. Okay. Okay? If you collapse in the street, okay, they're not going to find out what your citizenship is. They're not going to find out whether you can afford to pay for it. They're going to know nothing about you. What they're going to do is rush you to hospital and try and make you better. And when they do, they're not going to send you a huge bill no. for that. Like, and now, I'm, I'm actually also going to talk to the, uh, the, uh, the citizens, our whole citizens in Wade County. Mm -hmm. This health care affects you too. I mean, of course, yes. It affects our children, the working class, and the whole citizens. Yes. If we fix health care... Our children, if we get old, don't have to be worried whether or about our medical bills. Right. And that's important. We can solve this problem. That's important. Hey, we were slapped on the wrist for having the first show run a little bit long. So I think probably now would be a good time, because we could talk about health care for the next two or three hours without any problems whatsoever. What we're going to do is close this particular discussion on healthcare. Maybe we'll come back to it in the future. But once again, thank you so much for coming in. Thank you for having me. And um, this has been a wonderful discussion. I, 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 really, I really enjoy working with you, and I just wish you the best for District 48. I thank you so much. You're welcome. Thank you very much for joining us here in the Captain's Lounge. I'm Nigel Aves, your host. Over and out. <laughs>